Hodkinson, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you, Tom. How are you doing? I'm all good. Thank you for being the 100th visitor to Cultaholic Island. Cheers to you. Oh, cheers to you. should have got a bottle of bubble. Sh- we should have done. But thank you so much for having me. I've... Uh, I watched this for a long time. It feels surreal to actually be on the show oh. and let alone the hundredth episode as well. So thank you. Tell me you're from Yorkshire without mm-hmm. telling me you're from Yorkshire. Uh hey up. Nice. What's the on we? <laughs> What's the on we? What's the on we? What's the on we? What's the on we? What's the and, and for those listening in America? That means what are you on with? <laughs> what are you doing? How are, are you are doing? You, what are you doing? I like that. Which part of Yorkshire are you from? From Skipton, so North Yorkshire. Because I think to people around the world, sort of Yorkshire just gets lumped into the north. Yeah. Does that annoy you? Um, well, because I know we all have a laugh about e Andrew Dingle, we do. et cetera. I mean, it's, I think it's allowed because there's a lot of crossover with a lot of stuff. But they're, they're, they're all very different places with very different things. And, uh, you know, it's weird to have, I don't usually have pride in a lot of things, but I mean, being Yorkshire is one of them. I think, for sure. Why are you so proud about being from Yorkshire? Just because my family are from Yorkshire and stuff, and there's very much like a working class mentality, especially in my family and, and everything. And I think in Yorkshire as well, just with all the farming stuff and growing up around that and, and really just like knuckling down and getting on with the things you want to get on with. I really like that about it. There's an energy to Yorkshire like that. I think everybody that you speak to, like there's that there's that northern steel yeah. that comes from it, I think. Yeah. Um did you were you were you proud of being from Yorkshire when you were younger? Or is that something that came later on? That came later on. I think when I was younger, you kind of don't really think about those things so much. And then it was more sort of when I started getting into music and things like that and seeing bands like Arctic Monkeys and everything and the Cribs and and people like that and Bring Me the Horizon you're like this is like this represents where I'm from and stuff and I really like that it it just felt right and that's when I was like yeah I'm from Yorkshire yeah it's all good you I'm wear it good. you wear it like a badge then yeah. you're like yeah I'm proud to be from here definitely um you, you're living up in the northeast mm-hmm. now though I mean presumably would you would you want to move back at some point never <laughs> never so that's the thing like as much as I'm very proud to be from Yorkshire I'm fine staying here I I wanted to get out of Yorkshire uh well Skipton from for all my life growing up so to finally get out of there I'm feeling happy just to stay here forever Okay, well, we'll touch, I want to touch on that a little bit more as mm-hmm. we get into it, but we are here today to talk about uh, your life and times and um, give you three wrestling matches to watch while stranded on a desert island. Yeah. So um, you're going to pick three, we'll mm-hmm. burn them onto a, a metaphorical DVD, Ooh. and uh, you can do with them what you will, presumably watch them, one mm-hmm. would hope. Uh, what would you like your first match to be, Andrew? Um, I'd like my first match to be the Triangle Ladder match from WrestleMania 2000 with the Hardys, the Dudley Boys, and Edge and Christian. Okay, so... Why this match? Because this match got me into wrestling and solidified my love for it at a very young age. And at that point in time, I'd never, re- I'd seen little bits of wrestling and I was like, that's pretty cool, that's fine. But there was nothing that really excited me about it until I saw, wow, wrestling's more than just holds and big burly people rolling around. And this seeing the ladders in the ring and stuff and seeing these guys really put everything on the line and being quite young and, and smaller guys too, that was exciting to me because as just a, a smaller trim person, uh, that I was like, wow, other people can do stuff like that. And that's really cool. Um, with this match then, so you you say this is the match that turned you on to wrestling. Yeah. Where were you when you watched it for the first time? I was at my uh, auntie's house um on a farm in 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 Long Preston and my cousin who's a lot older than me he's my dad's cousin really but we like call him cousins and stuff uh he was in the other room just led on the sofa just watching this VHS of WrestleMania 2000 and um I'd seen little bits I was like coming in and out and I'd seen the um the, like the hardcore scramble stuff and I was like okay that's kind of cool and I was like dipping in and out coming backwards and forwards and then finally when I saw um, I think it was Bubba does an atomic drop to Jeff and the height of it and the way that Jeff sells it, I was like, that looks amazing. And I just sat down. He was like led on the sofa and I just sat down in front of him and 
that was it. I was transfixed throughout the whole entire thing. I was transfixed, and I was like, so it was the awesome. Bubba Bomb that really it was. brought you into wrestling. It was the Bubba Bomb, yeah. Away from all the holds and stuff that you'd. Mm-hmm. you'd what was your? You, you mentioned there about like holds. Like yeah, you thought it was a bunch of holds and stuff. What was your experience of wrestling before this? Then it was like old world of sports stuff. When I was very young, and I used to go around to my grandma's house. Um, she loved all of that, like giant hair stacks and all that stuff. And she'd have it on and she'd be like screaming at the TV, like, come on, come on. It's it's such a it's such a, a stereotype when you hear stuff like that, but it's very true. Yeah. Like and, and you're from again, it's that Yorkshire Pride again. Like Yorkshire was such a hotbed for wrestling at, oh, that, at that point. Yeah. The sport came and you know, it was built in the mm-hmm. in the Yorkshire, in the in the in the smoky back rooms of Yorkshire pubs, yeah. essentially. It was it it was really I'd, obviously back then I just didn't get it and it and, and that wasn't for me. I've obviously grown to appreciate a lot more sort of technical old school kind of wrestling and things like that now. Um, but back then I was like, I don't get it, but grandma's having fun, so I'm fine. And then I'd be like, come on, I just want to see Blankety Blank now. Come on, let's get World of Sport done. Let's get Lily Savage on TV. <laughs> um, with, the, with that match, with the Triangle Ladder mm-hmm. match then, so your cousin was watching it, he was chilling out on the sofa, you saw the bubba bomb. Mm-hmm. You stayed with the match. Was there anything else from that match that you remembered watching for the first time and thinking, "This is this is amazing"? Another bubba Dudley spot where he is, uh, him and Matt Hardy are on the outside, and he set up a table and uh, he just power bombs Matt straight through off the announce table through a table, and it is still to this day, in my in in my opinion, the best power bomb I think I've ever seen. The way Matt just like perfectly goes through it. And like just it, the table just folds and splits in half. I was like, oh, wow. There's a weird satisfaction, like not unlike like popping uh, the the packing sheets and stuff yeah. when a power bomb like that is done so perfectly. Like, oh, it's very neat and very tidy. So it's, good. It's, it's deeply satisfying that was. So you stayed and watched the whole show then. Yeah. Really so after that, and 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 obviously, I mean, there's some WrestleMania 16 gets a bad rep. But I hold it, obviously, in high regard just because it was the first Mm. major wrestling show that I'd seen. So you still got, like, the match of uh, Chris Benoit, uh, Kurt Angle, and Chris Jericho. And I think it's, like, the two falls, and it's for the Intercontinental and the European Championship. Yeah, first fall for the IC, second fall for the Euro. That match is so, so good. Like, really good. Um, The main event at the time as well, like, seeing Big Show, just this giant who I'd never seen anybody is big as that before like moving around and stuff i was like wow and like seeing mick foley and then eventually becoming a big fan of of mick foley stuff later on too um there was a lot of stuff in there that that really just grabbed me um as i mentioned before as well the hardcore stuff i was very much into like all the all the hardcore stuff and then that put me on to ecw a little bit later on and things like that and yeah it's just it just even to this day it really holds a special place in my heart, regardless of all the criticism that pay-per-view gets. You talk about um, staying with different members of family and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Were you quite a close family as you were growing up? Um, Yeah, we definitely were. And um, unfortunately, like as, as we got older and some things happened in the family and stuff, we grew apart. And that's sad. Like I still see quite a lot of them. Um, like some of them, the cousin that actually got me into wrestling and, and I, I borrowed the uh, WrestleMania 16 VHS from and then ultimately ruined it and replaced it with a Toy Story 2 thing, but that's a story for another <laughs> what? day. What? So, yeah. so, so what did you do? So you uh, had WrestleMania on VHS. So this was, yeah. if I remember correctly, WrestleMania 2000 VHS was a double VHS. It was with like a Best of Raw beefy on it. Beefy boy in It there, was yeah. so good. And from that Best of Raw thing, all I remember is uh, the... Um, I can't remember who it was now. Who used to do the Owen Hart impressions? Um, oh, gosh. The Owen Hart. I mean, there was a guy called Jason Sensation. That was it. Yeah, Jason, Jason Sensation. Sensation. Yeah, right. and he had the nose on and stuff, and I just remember him going, enough is enough, and it's time for a change and all that, and that was awesome. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so my cousin was like, yeah, you can take that and, and, and watch it as much as you want. And um, I did watch it as much as I wanted, and I rewinded it multiple times to the Triangle Ladder match to the point where it got stuck in... The um, it got stuck in the VHS player, oh. and I felt awful. And my dad was like, "Look, don't worry about it." And he like somehow we got the tape out, and it was all mangled. My dad was like, "Watch this," and he like damped the sticker and took the sticker off 
of the of the WrestleMania 16 VHS, did it on a Toy Story 2 one that we had, and just like swapped him around, put it in, and it was like, yeah, if you want to give it back to him, just give him that. <laughs> What? <laughs> but yeah, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen that cousin <laughs> recently, and we were just laughing about it. And um, I was just thanking him and stuff. I hadn't seen him in a lot of years, um, and I was just thanking him, like, thank you for getting me into wrestling. And uh, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be in the position that I am now, even if I was horrible and swapped the, uh, the VHS <laughs> out there. But did he? Did he ever question you about it? Never. Wow. I don't think. I think after that, he, he was kind of just like, "Yeah, there you go," and then kind of just forgot about it. Never so, thought about it. Never thought about it. So somewhere out there, if he's giving it away, there's WrestleMania 16, but it's Toy Story 2 instead. Oh, someone's got that in a car. yeah. It's, 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 that is in someone's house. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, and that's a, that's a great bit of ingenuity from your dad mm. as well. I like that as well. Is there is there a memory from uh, you growing up with your family that that always will make you smile? Because um, you say there's been like a rift yeah. since then, but like sort of before the things went down, or maybe something after. I mean, always we used to go on. Um, hol- we don't really go on holiday. Well, we didn't go on holidays too often when we were younger just because dad was always working my dad's a very hard working person and and was always providing for for me and my mum and everything um because my mum didn't work at the time so he was he was very much like that and we didn't get to go on holiday very often but we uh used to go to scotland every year which was which was quite nice and and uh i remember i must have been 10 if that maybe a little bit younger and um he was like come on we're going up ben nevis and we got really early uh one morning and uh, yeah, hiked up Ben Nevis, and I'll r- never forget that because it was so amazing. Like I love being from Yorkshire and stuff. I love the countryside and and uh, and views and everything. And and my dad taking me up there, um, me him and my mum, and just being able to look out onto everything was phenomenal. And there was still snow up there and stuff too. And it was awesome. It was so so good. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd always think about that. What did your dad do? My dad is he used to be a farmer. Um, and then when my mum had me, couldn't provide on farming money. So he became a tarmacker. So he's like a wagon driver and a tarmacker and stuff. Very much a grafter still to this day. Bless him. He's getting old now though. He's getting old. His bones don't work as, <laughs> as well as, uh, as they should, but he's very good with his hands and stuff. So he's, um, currently my mum does like glass painting stuff and crafts and things like that. So he's making like loads of boxes and woodwork and woodcraft stuff for, for her, so. They sound like a good team. They they are when they're not arguing. <laughs> they, there's a lot of arguing <laughs> in our family, but when they when they uh, work together, it's a it's a dream team. It's a dream team. What do they kick off about? Just just normal family oh, stuff. Anything. Dad gets a beer out of the fridge. Oh, you're drinking too much. All that uh, kind of stuff and and things like that. And yeah, pretty standard family. Uh, it, yeah, you know, families. We we don't. You can pick your friends. You don't pick the family. That's true. And that's just that comes with it, doesn't it? Yeah, I it really does. Do. Um, when you were, so when you, you, your dad is working mm-hmm. originally, on, originally on the farm and then moved away to other things, um, before Andrew discovered wrestling, what, what was Andrew going to do? Andrew was going to be probably a train driver, yeah? a train conductor, uh, an animator, um, a cartoonist, lots of things. I was into lots of things as a kid, but very much I loved trains. Well, as any white nerd does when they're <laughs> growing up, uh, love trains and obviously. How deep did the trains thing go? Train spotting? Train, train spotting. Yeah. Uh, went to the National Railway Museum multiple times to the point where the fat controller uh, used to get mad at me at York, uh, at York train station because they had like a Thomas the Tank Engine story time thing. And I used to be so excited that when he was telling stories, I'd get up and like run around like, oh, trains, trains, trains. And and the uh, fat controller was like, yeah, you, you to my mum, like, yeah, you got to get him out of here, will you? <laughs> I love fat controller going, oh, oh what a splendid boy. <laughs> yeah. He get him out of here. Get, 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 get him out. Ruining my story. <laughs> How old would you have been then? I must have been like four, five. Just, just excited and, and yeah. like head full of wonder being at, being at the train museum. Yeah, and that's what happens as well. Like when I get into something, I really get into it and get very excited about it. Like almost too excited to the point where I uh, get a little bit giddy and a little bit stupid and, uh, and, and end up maybe going a bit too far sometimes. So. Well, tell me about a time where you've, where you've got too into something and you've gone a bit too far. I mean, even just like on stream and everything, Tom, when, yeah. when the, when the, cause I love talking to the 
community and everything. And when they're like, yeah, do this, do this. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then they'll be like, no, no, don't, 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 actually, do, don't actually do that. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to do it. So I get like, when Adam's dad sent him ball cream for Christmas, um, uh, Nige pack there um, and people were like yeah put ball cream on some quality street and I was like I'll do it and they were like no don't do it so I was like yeah and then just <laughs> stupid stuff like that like I don't know why I do I get too excited and uh, and yeah and then you, and they go a bit far you just get swept away in, yes. in everything that's going on yeah. I imagine um, did you with the train with the train stuff can you remember when that sort of fizzled out because I used to be into mm. I used to watch Thomas the Tank Engine mm-hmm. as a kid so I get the train thing yeah but can you sort of pinpoint when that sort of fizzled out when like you you you, you rode that that train that ride that train really ride high, <laughs> and then it just it just sort of burst and then you weren't bothered anymore it must have been around the time I started getting into comic books and stuff and started getting into spider-man and and old like x-men comics and things like that and uh sort of the train thing fizzled out and then the love of superhero stuff and the love of illustrating and drawing and and things like that and also video games when i got my first uh, sega master system and sonic the hedgehog just literally as you know just sonic took over life mm. for a very 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 long time and still does to some degree to this yeah. day yeah oh yeah i mean it's, it's i think that there's a, a certain i think we're quite similar in the sense that like it's something that there's there's things that we loved as a child that yeah. always walk beside us yeah definitely and I, and I think and i think video games definitely is one of them mm. and you can see that when you know you you light up when you talk about them yeah um <laughs> which is because then we we've you know it's, it has been joked about um by by ross and such mm-hmm. like that but like the, the the origins of coming here weren't necessarily to do with wrestling, which we'll touch on in a bit. Yeah. Um. But when with your love of video games, when was there a particular game that you remember that you first played that really s- sort of set your world on fire? It was yeah. It was it was Sonic. It was was it Sonic? Uh, yeah. It was the Chaos. The Chaos one on the what the was Master it? System. The Master System. It was like Master System two though, because we couldn't afford like a proper one. So we got like um, my cousin Graham at the time wanted an N sixty four. So mm. he sold my mum and dad the Master System two, uh, so he could afford an N sixty four. But it was yeah the what was it Chaos? I can't remember. It was what called it was. Sonic Chaos. It was just called Sonic just Chaos. Called that Sonic was it. Chaos, I and I loved it. And I also remember when he was like, yeah, no, if you just switch the console on, it's got Sonic one already built into it. And mm. I was like. <laughs> Whoa! No way! And like that blew my mind. So that and uh, Streets of Rage uh, two, I think it was, was amazing. I could never finish those games though. I'd always always be like, Dad, can you do it? For me? It's weird how dads back then were like video game masters. So was your dad a video game master as well? Yeah, my my dad very much. He got me my first PlayStation One as well, uh, which just again solidified my love for everything sony and playstation and uh he got me that more so for himself because i remember the two games he got were tomb raider mm. um obviously for i think the the breeds the breeds the and breeds. uh the madonna breeds the pixel breeds and uh formula one and he got like a mad cat steering wheel or two and uh, he loves all his racing stuff and i'm not a racing fan at all um but he got me them i think with the intention of oh we'll get bored of these and then i'll get to play all the stuff um and then and then yeah no i got absolutely hooked on tomb raider and and that was it is he quite a young dad your dad no he's like in his he must be i can't even remember it's pretty bad i think he's in his 50s now but he likes my dad's awesome because my dad is very much if 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 I'm into something, he's not one of those people that kind of just like nah whatever yeah just let him get on with it. My dad's very much like let me be invested in that as well because you seem so excited in this and um, yeah my I, my dad had quite a few sort of problems with with his own dad, my granddad and 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 my granddad not being interested in the things that he was into. So I think my dad is like let's I want to give my son what. I necessarily didn't get so which is so sweet and and he's the best he took me to live events and stuff like wrestling live wrestling events and um to to gigs in scotland and everything too like he's just taken me everywhere he's 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 honestly he's the best he's a good man so when like because when wrestling came along Mm -hmm. like was did you think this this would be just another i think i'm really into for a bit yeah and then i'll just like drop off like a little bit and i mean i guess to some extent it was, although that lasted for a, a longer period of time than than some of the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But that was something else. I remember sitting in the front room when Heat used to be on Channel 4, which uh. helped because we, we couldn't afford Sky back in the day. So um, Heat used to be on Channel 4, and me and my dad would sit there on a Sunday afternoon and watch it, and my mum would just be like, oh, you know, that's fake, don't you? It's not real. What do you like this stuff for? And my dad's like, yeah, don't listen to it. It's fine. Like, it's all really cool. <laughs> like, Kitten's doing all this stuff, all the fire's coming out. It's blatantly like, real, oh. mum. He's bringing all that fire. Exactly, right? Um, that real. man's burnt to death. He's come back from the brink of death, mum. <laughs> Um, um and my dad yeah my dad's just he's 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 very good at um I, he gets me excited about the things maybe if i've like dropped off something my dad'll be like oh how's that going and i'll be like yeah i've not done it in a little bit and he's like oh it was really cool when you did this this and this and and uh yeah he he he's an incredible man and is he invested in what you're doing right now yeah he loves it so when um the like the wwe highlight stuff was on channel 5 He'd watch it every week to see if there was a cultaholic sign there, oh. which was really sweet of him. And like, um, I just tell him about everything. I was like, oh, I'm buzzing for you, I'm buzzing for you. And I told him about the chops recently and he was just laughing his head off. Like, he, he's just genuinely um, so happy for me when a lot of my family don't really get what I'm doing. Um, I don't really understand it. Coming from a working class family, they kind of think if you're not working with your your hands, if you're not getting sort of dirty or in farming or building or construction or anything like that, it's kind of what you're doing with your life. But my dad's very much like, just do what you want to do. Have you had some conversations like that then with your family where yeah. you had to kind of explain what you're doing a and lot. justify it? Yeah, and um, it sucks when you're, uh, you feel embarrassed by what you do because I don't think you should be embarrassed by what it is that you love so much. But trying to explain to like my my grandma or something like that, like, oh, this is what I do and I do stuff on camera or I edit these videos and things like that. And she looks at it and is like, yeah, and that's it. And there's no sort of engagement with it and stuff. And it's it's I think to to a lot of people and, I, and I've I've had this I get this a little bit sometimes it's like it's a world that isn't known it's yeah just, and it's something that like we're very lucky essentially mm -hmm. our hobby is paying the bills yeah and and that's bizarre to think about and, exactly and so it's you know you kind of the, the general consensus in life is that you have a job that you don't like mm -hmm. so you can spend time doing the things that you love yeah. it's like well we're in that beautiful situation where we're in a job that we love and it's kind of based on the things that we love exactly and and that's sometimes quite hard to comprehend like the amount, yeah. like the, the conversations i with my dad about like when I was doing radio stuff and it was like, oh, you know, when are you going to get a proper job? And it became yeah. a joke as time <laughs> went on, you know, to the fact that like, I'll be, I'll send him a video or I'm doing something on BBC Newcastle. And he'll yeah. go, go and get a proper job. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're paying for this now with your license fee. Thanks for that. Um, but yeah, so I get that. And it's yeah. a weird one to explain to people. Mm. Um, Let's get on to your second match. Yeah, of course. Let's, let's, let's dig straight in. So your second, so we've had the, uh, the triple threat, mm -hmm. uh, the triangle ladder match from WrestleMania yeah. 2000. What would you like your second match to be, sir? So my second match is going to be uh, from a main event of Raw in 2013, February 25th. It's CM Punk versus John Cena, and it's the one where the winner goes on to face a rock at WrestleMania 29. Wow. Okay, so this is a deep cut. It's a deep cut. So at this point, I'd fallen off wrestling big time. I'd... Uh, Sort of for years and years and years, me and my, me and my friend, me and my best friend, uh, when we were kids, Mark, were like, we wanted to be wrestlers. We, we, we had like uh, gym memberships when we were really young, like stupid young. And we go like every week and do CrossFit and stuff. And we're like, we're going to do this. We're going to go to a wrestling school and everything. But unfortunately, where we lived, there was no sort of, there was, there was no um, sort of wrestling school option and stuff back then. So... He sort of went one way and then I went into like the music stuff and went off and, and went to college and, and university to pursue music. And then during that period, I was in my last year and some of the people that I used to hang out with was like, oh, WrestleMania is coming up. We should watch some some wrestling and stuff. And I was like, wow, God, I haven't even thought about wrestling in so long. And we sat down to watch that show and I remember not really being invested in it. Um, at all until that match and hearing Punk come out to uh, Cult of Personality, which a living color and a fantastic band. We were like, ooh, oh, this is cool. And then obviously knowing John Cena, uh, one of my favorites growing up, like when he won the belt at WrestleMania 21 from JBL, like huge moment and stuff. And um, yeah, that match is top to bottom phenomenal. And I like it even more for the story of... Um, Punk being incredibly incredibly ill 
during that match and being backstage and talking to Cena and being like, I don't want to do this. I can't be bothered to do this. Like, I just want to get it over with. And Cena was like, what do you want to do for the match? And Punk's like, I don't know. But all I know is I want to give you a pile driver. And, mm-hmm. and Cena's like, fair enough. And they just went out there and called the whole entire thing. And that blew my mind so much because it reminded me so much of when me and my friend Mark were kids and we used to wrestle on the trampoline and stuff and we'd just go and go and go and go and go and like false finishes and finishes and all that kind of stuff happening. It just, it instilled me with the excitement again that I hadn't felt for wrestling since I was a lot younger. And just, yeah, that match from top to bottom storytelling, the, how it starts so slow and then builds and builds and builds the crowd getting behind every single thing that each of them do. They really make that match so much. I think Punk even said in that thing, like they they were the reason that he wanted to keep going in that match too, was because they were just rallying behind it so much. And uh, yeah, just that, that again, I guess all these matches hold a place where the triangle ladder match is where I started. The sort of this match is where I kind of like dip my toe back in a little bit again. And the third match is where I got fully like back in, but I love this match so much. It feels like the similarities about all three is that they will be matches that will pull you in. Yeah. And like, you know, from the triangle match to this one as well, mm-hmm. like it pulled you back in. So you were watching this with friends at uni mm-hmm. at this point. Yeah, at this say. point. Yeah. Did you reach out to Mark and tell him that you'd watch the wrestling again? No, me and Mark fell out of touch for a, for a very long time. Like once we sort of both split off to do different things, we text every now and then a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, I regret not staying in touch with him. I've only recently like properly got back in touch with him and stuff. We had a call the other weekend and, and was just talking about wrestling and stuff. He's now in New Zealand uh, doing work there, which is really cool. And um, yeah, it, it, I, I think I should have done, you know, I think I should have done because I think he's also been dipping in and out every now and then. And we've had similar thoughts about certain things. Um but yeah, I feel like we should have done. We should have rekindled the uh, the old. What what was the? We had a promotion. A promotion. The two of us. Oh, we HCW. Wanna, that was it. What does HCW stand for? Hardcore Championship of course Wrestling. It of course it did. did. Come on now. HC. Okay, so um, so who was in Hardcore Championship Wrestling? It was it was so Mark was the executioner. Of course, Mark loved like the Undertaker and people like that. So he was like a bigger guy. Um, and he, I mean, like he is a he's like taller than me and and built a lot. He's you know he's a he's a He's a very muscular man, that Mark. <laughs> uh, and me being just like a skinny white nerd as well. Just so, like, so who are you then? If he was I the executioner, was, who are you? I started off as Abel, right? Kane's brother? It's because I wanted to be in a tag team with Kane called Kane and Abel. You see, that was what he started off as. And because he, he was all in red, I wanted to be in blue and stuff. But then... Blue Kane? Blue Kane, exactly. Green Kane, the origin Kane. of Blue Kane? Yeah. Um, so that was that. And then I changed my name to... Even something even worse, which okay, was I'm, savage. My body is ready. Go on. It was it was it was just savage. Oh, just that savage. Was it. it was just savage. <laughs> I thought yeah. you were gonna say, oh, it was the, no. And then later this. on, I was like, oh yeah, Andy Savage. Andy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Why has nobody thought of Andy Savage? I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's a proper local indie name. Yeah, it is. Macho Man Andy Savage. <laughs> oh, why has no one done Andy Savage till now? <laughs> it could have been the Nacho Man, and I could have come out with one of those Nacho sombreros and everything. But the no. Nacho Man Andy Savage. Did you do an elbow? <laughs> I didn't. I did a swanton. Of course. Um, for my, Randy for my, Savage's uh, favorite move. Oh, his favorite move of all time. We all remember when he was swantoning yeah, people. I used to love Randy Savage going to extreme. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, do, do, do. Doo 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 Look at my thong. Um, so that was Miss Elizabeth. I, yeah. I apologize. Got them mixed up. Um, away. Okay. So hey, so did you have a belt before we go? Actually? We did. We designed so many because I was into the illustrating stuff. So I'd make multiple belt designs and uh, we'd cut them out and things like that and stick them on bits of cardboard and stuff. And, <laughs> yeah. Which um, which champion were you? were you? Was it just the one champion? It was just the one champ because there was only two of us. There was I only suppose. one championship. Like some of our other friends would get involved, but it was me and Mark that were fundamentally the uh, the absolute mad heads. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me a memory of, that you and Mark share away from HC Dub uh, that you always think of. Um, in... 
I've told this story before on on stream and stuff, but in year eight, I think towards the end of year eight, I uh, managed to chop my door, uh, chop my door off, chop my thumb off in a door at school. Um, just like full on to the knuckle, like came off, got trapped and, and popped off. And uh, for like that whole entire summer, um, after I had it stitched back on and stuff, um, and couldn't really, I wasn't allowed to do anything because if I knocked it, it'd just go whoop and just like pop off again. Um, so what, happened was for the whole eight week period of summer holidays, I'd be super sad about not being able to go out. And uh, we had what was it, SmackDown versus Raw 2007 or something like that. One of them, I'd seen her and Batista on the front of it. And uh, I was really sad that I couldn't play PlayStation with both hands. So I learned to play PlayStation with one hand. And uh, Mark used to come around. I think Mark knew I was sad and stuff. And he used to come around and, uh, and he was like, yeah, let's just play some games. Let's just sit and play some games. Even on like the nicest days as well, um, Mark would just come around and the whole entire day we just play uh, wrestling games together. And um, yeah, I think he was going easy on me because I beat him a few times and I think he was being easy on me, <laughs> but which I appreciate as well. I think he saw that I was a bit upset about not being able to go out and do stuff. And uh and yeah, that was that was really nice. We we've been to wrestling shows together and stuff as well. Like our dads took us to our first uh, WWE live event, which was Summer Bash, where we got to see like Eddie Guerrero and, and Rey Mysterio go at it. And um, the main event, Tom Hoare, the main event. Go on. Are you ready? Yeah. John Cena, Kurt Angle, JBL in a triple threat match for the <sighs> WWE Championship with. Stone Cold Steve Austin, a special guest ref. What? Where was this? I was in Manchester in 2000 and what, five, four Gosh. or five or something like that. A long time ago. It was a house We show. don't know how good we had it. I know. We? we really we did. We really don't know we how really good we had it. We really did. Like back then as well, it was insane. Like to think that I've seen Eddie Guerrero live, uh, had, the, had the opportunity to do that. And with Rey Mysterio as well, like them two going at it is... Very lucky. That's Very amazing. lucky. amazing. Yeah. It's a hell of a main event. Really? Is. Yeah, it really is. What what spurred you to get back in touch with Mark recently? Um, I think well he just he just sort of he sort of messaged me. I think the pandemic kind of made me realise that I should keep in contact with people a lot more. I um feel like I've fall out of touch with people quite a lot because inherently I'm quite a I am quite a shy and, and reserved person and I feel like I'm annoying people if I message them out of the blue and stuff and often for example now that I've moved I've definitely fallen out of contact with a lot of people just because I feel like I don't want to bother them or if I've left it too long I don't want to seem like I'm uh, uh, coming back for wanting something or trying to stay in contact with people just because uh, so he, I think he messaged me first and we were just talking about, he just messaged me something random about the wrestling. And I think he was like, oh, I seen you're on a YouTube channel thing now talking about wrestling and stuff. So we just like back and forth through that, which was, um, it's really nice that wrestling's come full circle and brought a lot of things back for me, which is, uh, which has been really nice. You've talked about sort of coming from sort of working class roots what was the 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 vibe about you going to university? Good because yeah. I was I think I might have been the first in the especially my well, my dad's side of the family for sure the first going to uni so everyone was super proud super excited. It was for music so they might not have been too proud um, because I'm, I'm I'm sure they would have wanted something a bit more like business or something like that but. Uh, yeah, pride. My mum was very proud of me, uh, no matter how many times I wanted to quit when I was there. Um, and and yeah, there was a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of pressure for sort of finishing and then getting straight into a job and stuff like that, um, which unfortunately I wasn't able to find in music, especially around the area that I lived in and stuff. Because that's the thing when you go and you, you, it's not just a case of, I think people still now go into the system and don't realize it's like when you go into like mm. a media course where mm -hmm. it's like it's not just a case of okay you're finished and here's your music job yeah okay you're uh, you finished your three years of music yeah. and here's your guitar you're off to work for Pearl Jam yeah like it's not <laughs> 
it's not like it's not like an entry level into Metallica. No, it's just like you just you you have to once you come out, it gives you those three years give you uh, the fundamentals, and and if you have the uh, the the initiative to find yeah. your own way, then you will. But yes. it gives you the groundwork definitely to get that started. It's not. It doesn't mean like because I had people. I I'm, I had a conversation with somebody recently, and they said they just finished their degree in radio production, and they're yeah. like, now what do I do? I said, well, now you get a job in radio. Yeah, and it's like, and and, and it's almost like that that level isn't taught there. You've mm. got to have that instinct yourself. You, without and, a doubt. Yeah, like the the uh, I'd even go so far to argue that I mean, where I I went to Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, and the music course was in crew, which is not the music. It's not a music. It's not a booming music central hub. Nobody Tom. thinks crew. No, nobody thinks crew. Crew is a crew is a train station. Crew so is a town a nice that was built station. around the train station. Apparently, it's it was a satellite. One of the, town. Yeah, it was one of the. I think from what I've heard, it's one of the very few places where the train station was there first, and then the town got built around it. Um, if you don't want to live in Wrexham or Stoke, come live in Crewe. It was, it was, it was mm. dire, and I would even go to argue that the fundamentals weren't even there for us. The the course itself was very much like do this research file because this is going to get you far in life. Never used a research file again in my life, like things like that. Like we'd have people come in and speak about stuff, which was that was probably like the most uh, informative things that we could have asked for because it's actual people that have gone out and done things and been like yeah go this direction but the things that they taught you fundamentally you just I've personally never used again in in life and stuff like that and it felt like a waste in some way but then again it didn't because I met some incredible people and went on to do really fun things like when I left I think more than anything staying on to do university you sort of your willpower is strengthened to keep going and then i remember after university because i wanted to get into composing music for video games and stuff i just put loads of my music on forums like video game forums and stuff and started writing music for um mobile games and things like that uh, just freelance because i wanted some experience and stuff and and uh that didn't really lead to lead to anything um and then I got into a, a, a few bands and stuff, and we did pretty well. Like, uh, one of we did multiple tours. One of the bands, the last band that I was in, we got on Radio One, which was really cool. Like, wasn't even told about it until someone messaged us being like, Oh, yeah, fine, you're on BBC Radio One. I'm like, What? <laughs> you were what? just, oh, just randomly yeah, playing on Radio just, One. Just randomly, and which was insane. Is that like through BBC introducing? It wasn't even through introducing. It was oh. like, I think Hugh Stevens or something had heard it and was like, yeah, just put that on the Stick thing, on. and like, which was insane to us. Um, but even then, stuff like that doesn't guarantee you a a career in things like that. Um, even though when you're younger, that you'd think, oh, if I get on there, that's it. Like everything opens up. Like the music and the arts industry is 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 tough, and you've got to have a lot of resiliency and a lot of you're gonna go through a lot of heartbreak, a lot of rejection, a lot of just really putting your knuckles in and just trying to work as hard as you possibly can to make something work. And sometimes, unfortunately, it doesn't. But I think if you're incredibly, incredibly passionate about it, you'll just keep going until you will eventually get there, get some semblance of of uh, success, at least success in what in, in terms of what you might view it as, you know. It's the way, the way to look at it is, is that these courses like this will give you a jetpack, but you yep. have to get the rocket fuel for yes. it. You have to then use that accordingly. Without a doubt, yeah. And you, you mentioned that your mum had talked you out of quitting uni a few times. Yeah. Uh, was, there, can there, was there a few occasions that you went, oh, I just don't want to be here anymore? There's, there was a few, like, growing up and even still to this day, um, very much have self-doubt. Uh, a lot of mental health anxieties and stuff like that. And I remember in the first year of university, it took me six months to make friends or to talk to anybody because I was super shy and um, just coming from a... I mean, there was other people in the same situation coming from just a small country town to this big, everybody's there. Everybody's in the same boat, though. You have to remember that. But it was very tough. It was very tough. But I was thankful in that people sort of took me in a little bit and and uh, were very accommodating and very nice to me and, and helped me come out of my shell quite a bit. Um, 
But yeah, my mum was like, you got to stay, you got to stay, because once you get that piece of paper, that's it, you can do anything. And to some degree, yeah, I mean, that that is true. If there's something there, people look at you a bit more like, oh, okay, well, they've done this at least. Mm. So, you know, they've got the willpower to do something and then maybe that'll apply to, to this job and such and such. And um, yeah, my mum very much taught me out of it. My dad was kind of like, if you know, if you've got something planned and you want to do it, you do you, just make sure you're happy. My mum and dad are very parallel in that in that sense. My mum's mm. very much like, you gotta keep at it, you gotta do it. My dad's like, look, enjoy what you want to enjoy, enjoy what you do, but make sure you're happy doing it at the same time. Well, as you say, like your dad's come from a place where like his dad didn't, yeah. didn't really give that much interest or encouragement to what he yeah. was doing. So he's kind of doubling down. Yes, definitely. You. And I think it's nice, it's kind of nice you've got that parallel with your mum mm. being very uh, pragmatic <laughs> and like just get the thing done. Yeah. And your dad being like, just just do whatever makes you happy. Mm-hmm. That's that's a nice contrast to come by. Um, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, like you suffer from self doubt and anxiety and such like that because I think a lot of people who will will, will see you on a Monday mm. will just see the the the, the four year old Andrew that's running <laughs> yeah. around the fat controller. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and I think it is it's easy to forget that like. Uh, you're with people behind it yeah and a lot of the time we put those Mm -hmm. because you have to (laughs) appreciate like we're you know away from it all it's great that we all hang out but when you do those streams we're entertaining yeah so you kind of have to even when you have those days when you don't want to be there you sort of palliachi face it yeah you do it and uh and it's so it's interesting to hear you talk about stuff like self-doubt and where do you think that comes from with you Um, because there's always there always has to be a starter cap for something like yeah. that. Yeah, I guess, I think ever since I was young, um, especially at school and stuff, people, you go to a parent's evening and things like that, and they're like, yeah, he's he's very good. He'll go on to do amazing things. And that puts a lot of pressure on you. I don't think I'm incredibly, I'm not incredibly smart. I don't think I'm incredibly talented either and stuff like that. And uh, it put a lot of pressure on me. And then I just you overthink it a lot. And then I, I can't. I can't do this. I know I can. I know I can do it. I know I can apply myself to it and do it. But I want to do the best of what I can do. And I don't know if that matches up to what other people sort of perceive and stuff. So I get very, I just doubt myself a lot. And recently I've just been going through a lot of things in my head to, to the point where I was like, I don't know if I can stream anymore. I was having panic attacks, walking home from work. Uh like the other week, my legs stopped working on the way to on the way home. I had to sit on a on a wall and be like, "Okay, I gotta calm down and stuff." And can you remember what caused that? I not a clue. Again, just recently, like um, I feel much better now. By the way, like lots of things have have happened in the last few weeks. But um, I think thinking I'm just not good enough. There's so many people in the office, like outside. Dan, incredibly talented. Owen, incredibly talented. Um, behind the scenes, Luke, everybody. And um, they are so hardworking and such wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and I'm just a guy from a just a small town that's come into this in two years and is not incredibly talented or gifted. And I've, sometimes I feel like I've waltzed in and, and somehow... I've just been given this when I don't necessarily deserve it. Um, and I feel like everybody else deserves their time to shine because they deserve it more than anything. Um, Why don't you deserve yours? Just because I'm not... Ne- I'm not... Um, I, I, I feel like sometimes I just haven't put the work in, even though deep down I know I've put the work in. But to me, I'm just like... I see other people's work that they've done and I'm like, they are so good. And I'm not that good. You know? <laughs> I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> Too late, mate. <laughs> I think um what you have to understand is this uh, like and I and I had to learn this because I I was in a similar situation to you when I started yeah and I get where all this comes from because you're joining an established core of people Mm -hmm. in a high stakes business which is very much driven on personality and character and such and 
yeah, I, I often refer to myself as the fifth Beatle. Yeah. Because that's come and I joined when it was a much smaller team. Mm. That's how it felt. You know, it was four, used to be five, and then it's four, and then I'm there, and it's, you measure everything. Yeah. Against what everyone else is doing. And you have to reach a point where mm. you go, I've not, I'm not being given this out of sympathy. Yeah. And I had to realize that and, and, and people help me realize that. And I say the same to you, boss, um, that nothing that you've been given is out of sympathy. Mm. It's being given because the people involved believe that you are the right person to do it. There's no, it's not like a, let's do Andrew a favor. If, you know, to, to make it uber blunt, like you joined, and we'll talk about how you joined in a yeah. bit, but like, um, you joined to, to edit mm -hmm. and then opportunities came up where you ended up doing some bits on camera. And I remember Adam telling me saying, I want to do more stuff with that with Andrew on camera. I was like, brilliant, do it. And that's not done out of sympathy. That's not done out of let's just do him a favor because, mm. you know, make it blunt. If you were crap, <laughs> you'd have just been editing. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a, but and the fact that the first news video back in front of cameras, it was like, well, it's you and Andrew. I was like, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> wouldn't have it any other way. You know, and I know you were nervous about that. Mm. And, you, you know, and I, I message you, I message at you and it's different when you write it. Yeah. Because I, because you know, all the times we worked together on stuff. Because when we first worked together, you were editing stuff for me. Then mm -hmm. we did videos together, and then we did news together. And I always reach out and tell you. And and, and I don't say it if I don't think it. Mm. You know. And I think you're you're incredible at what you do. You have a, a skill set that will outlast many people here, myself included. You genuinely do. <laughs> That's so kind of you. You, you genuinely been, do. You've been incredible um, in helping me feel very welcome and in teaching me so much stuff um, since being on camera. And you've been nothing but nice ever since we did like graded and stuff together. Um, you've been so wonderful and you've helped me through a lot when I've been feeling incredibly anxious being on camera. Uh, same for Adam and, and Sam and Ross and Jack, everybody has just made me feel so welcome and, uh, and so, at Jack. ease. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> Stealing my hat gimmick, what's he doing? <laughs> no, I'm... <laughs> Everybody's been so kind and, and accommodating and I know I can be difficult to work with. When? Sometimes. When? Just when? Just when? Like, when? Just when? When I'm... I when get, have I you get been difficult to work with? I get nervous and awkward with? and sometimes I know when? I'm not the easiest to bounce Jeez, off, man. Jesus, when? God damn it. When have you been difficult? <laughs> Tell me I a just... single time. <laughs> you are know. the least <laughs> difficult person. <laughs> You're the least difficult person. And I've worked with Ellie Golding. Whoa. And you're the least difficult person <laughs> I've ever worked with. You are you are the opposite to that. You are the opposite. You are the most accommodating person that I've ever worked with. <laughs> you're something like, and and I know that's not easy. And and that a part of that, I think part of that is driven from this. And it's awful because I get it, because it's driven from this feeling of not being good enough. So therefore, you've got to always be on, always yeah. be there, always be ready. Because mm -hmm. if I'm not, they're just going to, yeah. you know, and that's drilled into you. And that comes back to like getting out into the industry and the music industry and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's drilled into you that if you're not there at this time, well, there's a million that's of you, it. off you go. Yeah. And that's drilled into you from the very top. And, and, and it sucks because... Whilst it does give you that that mentality of I want to strive for greatness, it doesn't give does a lot doesn't do a lot for your self confidence. No, when someone doesn't. says if you don't do it, there'll be other people that will. It's like well, well but then that's the thing. Yeah. If you left here tomorrow, there are people here that couldn't do what you do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's true. There'd be, that's that's how it goes. You're so kind. It's true, and I mean it. I don't mean to shout. But you're not <laughs> difficult. Thank I you. I don't like you looking down that microphone and going, oh, yeah. I know I've been difficult. You haven't been difficult. You're the least difficult. Oh, you God. are the un the undifficult. You, you make it ridiculously easy. <laughs> oh, ridiculously God. easy. Thank you. You do too. Bless you. It's not about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the fact I've tangented a little bit. Um, I'm drinking out of a triple jump mug. That's deliberate. You are. That's the deliberate device. Oh, okay. Um, because the the whole like you're doing stuff with Cultaholic. That was mm -hmm. not originally the plan, was it? No. And I know people are gonna 
get at me for this as well. Oh, Sodom. Um, Absolutely Sodom. Absolutely Sodom. I was a huge fan of the stuff at um, What Culture, with both the wrestling side and Ben and Peter doing... Uh, it wasn't called worst games ever then. It was goal. It was called S S games for W's. For W's, yes, it was. And I used to sit at my then um, ex girlfriend's flat, and I would sit and watch them for hours and hours and hours and hours. And I would be like, "This, I want to do this. I don't know how I can do this. I don't know what to do, but this is the best thing I've ever seen, and I want to do this." And Everybody, Adam, Sam, Ross, Jack, Ben, Peter became my idols and something that I don't really watch TV anymore. It would be all the stuff on YouTube constantly. Whenever they bring something out, that was it. I was like on it straight away. And um, eventually in 2018, I was working at Tesco and I'd been working there for like four years at that point was like, I'm never going anywhere else. I'm never doing anything else. I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with life. I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, I saw, obviously, by this point, the the boys had broken off and phone call at Holic. And on the off chance, I was like, let's just have a look around for jobs and stuff. I quit my job at Tesco um, and got into a bit of a depressive funk and didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I was like, let's just have a look. And then on the off chance, went on the website, looked at the job listing, video editor, freelance video editor, never edited before in my life. And I was like, well, what's harm in trying? So I applied. And at that point I was thinking, I think Triple Jump had just joined the Cultaholic umbrella. Mm. And uh, I was like, well, I wonder if, because if it's just Ben and Peter, I wonder if down the line they'll need someone to like jump on over and help edit videos for them and stuff. And uh, I applied for Cultaholic first. Then a few weeks later came the Ben and Peter putting out the triple jump, like we're looking for video editors. And uh, I was like, that's it, right. I'm going for that one as well. So I sent a little snippet, sent that back. And I didn't hear anything. That must have been like January or something, January, February of 2019 at that point. And didn't hear anything back until March, April. Mm -hmm. of 2019 and I was with my band at that point didn't have any money because I wasn't working we were doing like a little tour so I was running out of money like get, paying for petrol and stuff and not really getting anything back from that and uh, we were in Birmingham and we just parked up and I got an email from Sam being like do you want to uh, do you want to do some freelance stuff and in that moment I was like yes done like everything else is done i don't want to sounds bad but at that point i was so burnt out with the music stuff i was like don't want to do the music stuff i just want to edit and that's what i want to focus on and that's what i want to get good at um so i said yes and then i remember uh, a few months down the line maybe two months or something adam messaged me and was like do you want to move up and have full-time position and i remember asking him um would i be able to work with triple jump as well because I I really like video games and stuff and I'd like to help out if I can. And Adam was like, I'm sure down the line, there's going to be something for you to do. Because I, apparently from what Sam, I think has told me, I was considered for both jobs. I right. think Ben and I think Ben's told me you were so close to being a part of Triple Jump. But then Sam was like, now nah, we're having him. We're ah. keeping him. So that is the reason why I'm here. But thankfully, I've gotten to work with the Triple Jump guys. I've gotten to do streams for them. I did some streams for them over the Christmas period. I edited their um, uh, every WWE game ranked from worst to best, which is one of the, my favorite things I've ever done uh, working here. And, uh, and yeah, it's been really nice to sort of just work with both teams and, and be able to be close to those guys too. Thankfully, we work in like the same offices, so it's easy just to like see them and stuff and um they've been nothing but accommodating as well it's been it's been a surreal experience because to me i'm still very much a fan of all of this stuff mm. and i'm still very much a fan of everything that you've done everything adam every like ben peter everybody has done so to like hang out with you guys now i remember in the first six months i was deathly afraid that i was gonna get fired I was like, I'm going. After that six months, they'll be like, you're working too slow, you're gone. But Do you think it was it they were, they thought you weren't quick enough on the on the draw? I mean, at that point, I'd been editing for what like a few months, so wow, I was scared that 
I was so slow and so inexperienced but, that they but, just chucked me out. But what does that say to you in terms of like your your ability and your uh, and the impression that you left? That if you'd only been doing it for a few months and uh, you were you were a part of an established mm. company full time and well, my you know. thought was they're just low on people, so they'll keep uh, me on for a little bit. And the 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 the, the thing is like. The, it, I try to get better every time. I try and stay behind later to get edits finished because I didn't want to disappoint anybody and I wanted to prove to people that I could do it. Mm. And thankfully, doing that helped me improve as well. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I just, I, that's, all I, that's all I ever want to do. I want to get better at what I'm doing because I know, especially on camera stuff, I'm not incredibly articulate with my words and things and I get confused and I get muddled. Uh, this Yorkshire tongue doesn't help. Uh, with the accent and stuff. <laughs> and I want to do people proud. And I want to, um, I just want to get better at my craft. And I want to make everybody, I know you can't make everybody happy, but I want to make as many people yeah. happy as I can because you guys have done that for me. And I want to do that for other people too. So, How did you come to end up doing stuff on the on in front of the camera? Can you remember the first conversation? I think Adam just messaged me and was like, do you want to do Twitch? And was he was like, it's just a breakup sort of the days and stuff. And um, part of me feels like he, he, he's very blase. We've like chatted before, but I, I feel very close to Adam now. And we chatted yeah. before and I've said like, thank you so much for everything. And he's always like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's nothing, it's nothing. <laughs> but like, I think he knew when we were in quarantine, um, a lot of people in the office um, were, I know a lot of them were, were alone, but a lot of people were in relationships and got to spend quarantine with people. and. Um, I was very lonely during quarantine and very sad and stuff. And uh, I think Adam knew that and was like, do you want to break up your week by doing streams and stuff? And I was like, mm. I would love to do that because that was another thing I always wanted to do was uh, stream on Twitch and play games and stuff. I get to play games and mm. talk to people. Like, yes, please. That sounds awesome. Um and then yeah, from there, from there, just did the Twitch stuff for a little bit, and then Adam messaged me and was like, "I think we're gonna put you on news." And I was panicking like mad. I was like, "Oh my god!" And that might have been in October of of what last year. And he was like, "Yeah, around Christmas time we'll get you on." Literally yeah. a week later, he was like, "You're on your first news," and I was like, <laughs> "Whoa, what?" And um, it threw me in at the deep end. But I'm kind of glad he did because it it didn't give me time to overthink stuff. Kind of just like. Push me in there it's a little bit. better that way sometimes. I think if he told yeah. you a month out, you're going to do news at the end of this month. I'd have been overthinking it for yeah. a whole entire month and it just would have been a disaster. It's sometimes better just the case. You know, yeah. That they just go, right, tomorrow you're doing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> away, away we go. Um, how did you feel going into your first um, Twitch stream? How did you feel after your first Twitch stream? First Twitch stream, very nervous. Mm. Incredibly nervous. Uh, but so accommodating. Um I know it's a cliche for people to say we have the best community uh, in wrestling YouTube or just the best community on YouTube. We genuinely mm. do. The people yeah. there that keep coming back, that keep supporting you every single week and saying wonderful things genuinely feel so much like friends now. And they helped me feel so comfortable. Um, and I wouldn't, if it wasn't for Twitch, if it wasn't for the community, I wouldn't have met uh, my wonderful girlfriend as well, Joanne. She was in the first stream. I uh, would never have thought things would be where they are now. Um, so how did that progress then? We you don't mind me asking. Just like started talking. Like she was very kind and in, in that when we when I'd finish a stream, she'd message and be like, awesome stream and stuff. And then we just started talking. We both love video games. So she was like, do you know anything about PlayStation trophies? Because we just like getting trophies, which sounds so nerdy, but we like that stuff. And we just swap like, yeah, this game's good for getting this and this and this and this. And then we just got to knowing each other, started playing games together on, on PlayStation over quarantine and stuff. And um, and yeah, things just sort of like blossomed from there. So when, so from, so you met, you sort of got to know each other during lockdown. Yeah. So when did you first meet? Um, it was in uh, April, uh, towards the end of April of this year. It was the first time. Um, and it was amazing. It was like the be the first time being out of Newcastle in a year, being sort of cooped up, not cooped up, but not being able to do as many things as as we could, uh, going out and, and her being like the first person that I saw that I got to hug and stuff. Insane. So cool. Had you sort of made your relationship official 
before you met or was it a case of you chatted a lot and then you got together and you went oh this is a thing kind yeah this is a thing kind of the, the, there was some other circumstances and stuff as well that i won't get into on the podcast and stuff sure. but um but yeah we very much met each other and 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 i think i think we both knew there was something there yeah. and then yeah like this last week we managed to be able to solidify it like circumstances came together and yeah amazing amazing yeah um tell me something about joanne that you especially love oh my goodness oh there's so much stuff how supportive she is through everything even when she didn't have to be um she could have just been like this guy's putting too much stuff on me he's sad he's whatever like nah go away but she was very much incredibly supportive and got me through a lot of stuff um my uh, with my grandma passing away this year um she was she was there down the mic for that and um not necessarily talking about that directly just making sure i was okay and taking my mind off it she's incredibly kind and thoughtful and and generous and selfless in everything that she does um she just wants to make sure that i'm that i'm happy and uh i just want to do nothing more than like to give all that back to her again because uh, yeah she uh she makes the days so much better she really does that's really lovely to hear i love that we've got one more match to get to we do which is uh but before we do uh we're bringing this back for those who um listen to desert and graps and go you haven't done it in a while we're bringing it back so <laughs> as well as taking yeah uh three wrestling matches you're also allowed to take with you a movie yes an album Ooh. and a luxury item Ooh. what would you like your movie to be andrew I'm going to take with me. I was thinking like, do you know what? It'll be like a Spider-Man or something like that because I love those films. But um, something that I feel like I've adapted from work, from watching these films so much, I'm going to take Chicken Run with me, Tom. <laughs> yeah! I knew you'd say chicken run. Yes. I just knew. And I'm so happy that you did. I knew you'd say chicken run. Mel Gibson's finest hour. Well, we'll um, forget about him. But. <laughs> um, what is it about chicken run that you love the boat? Is it the Yorkshire thing? It's the Yorkshire thing, right? the Yorkshire pride thing again? Because I could have gone with Wallace and Gromit because that was obviously where like animation and stuff solidified itself for me. But... I wanted to go with Chicken Run because it's something that um, I watched so much as a kid. Mm. And uh, I wanted to be an animator when I was younger. And I wanted to work for Aardman. And I wanted to do all these different kinds of things. And um, I think my love of animation really stems from that film. The way everything works. Like the big set pieces with the uh, with like the meat pie machine and stuff. Um, and I was always like baffled. How does that work? How do people do that in stop motion? And um, my love of animation carries over to the job now. Like I get to animate in videos, silly things, mm -hmm. very silly things. But I'm grateful that I got into animation through that, through like the slapstick kind of stuff, like the Armand stuff, uh, to be able to apply it to that. But um, yeah, very much like the Yorkshireness of it. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Tweedy just reminding me of my dad. Uh, Mrs. <laughs> Tweedy reminding me of my mum a little bit. Just like my mum always like, oh, I'll give over, just like slapping him. Well, she don't slap him. Let's <laughs> make that clear. There's no domestic violence in our household. But um, She's always cooking chicken pies. Always, always cooking chicken pies. And normally in a really ruthless manner. Yes, definitely. With giant like spiked <laughs> things. I don't know what that was. I love was the good. imagery of like an Ardman thing like that. Where yeah. They, where they, when, uh, I think the one thing that they love doing with Nick Park and such love doing is just is animating a giant mm. machine. Mm -hmm. You can see that there mm. is that rustic love for it yeah. every single time. And it still baffles me to this day how they do it. I still don't understand how they do stuff like raindrops in stop motion. Oh. I don't know why that doesn't it doesn't like click in my head. Like how do you do that? Because it's in stop motion. How is that thing I, it it baffles me and it intrigues me so much and and I'd love to get into that kind of into the weeds of that a little bit more. Um, if anybody's watching that can help that, then why please, not? Please do, do. It, do it. How does rain work in stop motion? <laughs> Explain phones? in comment sections everywhere. <laughs> How about an album? What album would you take? I would take with me. I was thinking about this as well. I was like, would I take something that would make me feel like at home and stuff? And I was like, should I take Bonnie Iver's first album? Uh, but no, I'm going to go for my favorite album of all time. I'm going to go for In Utro by Nirvana. Okay, so why is this one your favorite of all time? Because this one 
was the turning point in the music stuff for me, Tom. Okay. I used to love bands, still do like bands, like Guns N' Roses and things when I was younger. Like, oh, yeah, whiskey and stuff, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> but then I grew out of that um, quite quickly, and Nirvana opened my whole, just opened my eyes this whole other world of um, alternative music. Like, growing up, and the, the, obviously from Yorkshire, like, the hair metal stuff doesn't really, the, 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 how can I put it? Like, the aesthetic and stuff doesn't really apply to the Yorkshire stuff. And no, it's not fitting with Yorkshire, yeah. is it? Whereas, like, whereas Nirvana and the whole grunge and the whole alternative scene back in the 90s kind of felt a little bit like home in that there was loads of other bands along with us that were trying to get somewhere and trying to make it and we go and support every everybody's band and stuff and, and we do all this stuff and Nirvana just was the hub of finding out about the Pixies and the Melvins and other bands, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, all those kinds of bands, Green River and everything and um, they just, to this day I can listen to that album over and over and over and over again. I can't do that with very many albums because you get sick of it after a bit. You've heard the same songs like, Ugh. but that album, it's got just songs that are really melancholy and, and a little bit sad and stuff. And then you got ones that are just sheer brute force, like Dave Grohl's just pounding the drums and stuff and Kurt screaming his head off. And I love that so much. I love the contrast. I like bands that can do heavy and I like bands that can do just the like the sort of the soulful songs, the songs that mean something and they can really strike a strike a chord mm. in you, just like music on a guitar. Whoa. Oh, there it is, there. <laughs> uh, best song on in neutral. Scentless Apprentice. The drum beat. Straight boop, in there. Boop, gabble, gabble, <laughs> boop, boop, gabble. So good. So <laughs> good. That's like the best drum beat of all time ever. It's amazing. Um, would that been Dave Grohl on them? Still? Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So from Nevermind, um, I think he might have been on some things on Incesticide as well um, because it was Chad Channing on drums in Bleach. And then, yeah, Dave's proper studio debut, I think, was Nevermind. And yeah. So that would have been a bit of Dave Grohl drum action. So good. Uh, a luxury item, sir. This one's tough because um, I'd like to take my guitar with me, but... Could I give up video games, Tom? I don't think I could. <laughs> I don't know so, if you could, to be honest. <clears throat> I'm going to die on Vita Island. I'm going to die on PlayStation <laughs> Vita Island, a, a console that's been forgotten to time, Tom. Now, I've heard you bigging up the PlayStation Vita <sighs> in the office on multiple occasions. Honestly. What, why do you think the Vita has just been lost in the vortex? Just because I feel like not a lot of studios supported it so much. You get people like Drink, so Drinkbox, who did Guacamole and stuff, really like applied the the workings, the the physical attributes of the PS Vita to their games. So you get like the touchscreen stuff in Seven and everything. I don't think a lot of people did that. People were just like, oh, they just port stuff to it, and it's blah blah blah. Like it's just not as good as a mm. as like a a Nintendo handheld or something like that, and. It's not, it's just, it's like a PS3 tone, <laughs> a tiny PS3 in your hands, and you've got the whole back catalogue of PS1 stuff, PS2 stuff, PSP stuff, on top of all the awesome Vita games, like you got Persona, Persona 4 Golden and things like that, and uh, Freedom Wars and, and stuff, and like, it, I don't know why it gets lost to time, and, and, now I'm, and now if PlayStation made a Vita 2, Granted, it probably wouldn't do as well because mm. just of the Switch and, and, and PS5 and everything. Like, I think, again, it would just get forgotten. But if you can get a Vita off eBay, um, I got one recently for Joanne because she loves Persona. And I was like, you got to get this. And I got dr very drunk one night, forgot I'd ordered it. And then a Vita turned up at the office and I was like, <laughs> that's something I did. Um, but... It's a phenomenal console that still stands the test of time. And you can like you can get a PS TV, plug it into your TV and then play it with a controller and switch stuff. for a switch. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's 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 basically it. And uh, the switch is awesome. I love the switch so much, but I, there was something like magical about the Vita before obviously the switch and stuff came out. Like, um, yeah, I just I will die on, on Vita Island forever. I like how every time you say a Vita, I keep thinking, Don't cry for me, Argentina. <laughs> I thought you meant like a Bell Vita. I, was like, I just think of biscuits. Oh, all the time. biscuits for yeah. breakfast. <laughs> I mean, do you think it's the format, maybe? 
Because I, I know PSP had those weird sort of discs. The in UMD it. discs. Yeah. yeah. Do you think... Do you, and, then P, and then is the Vita smaller disc? Vita's just got little cartridges. Kind of like, like a Switch now. Right. Okay. I just wondered whether or not... the Because obviously the PSP, I think the format was what put people off. Yeah. Like, I don't know what... Carrying like, around these giant discs all the time. This. Like, you know... <laughs> As a, but then if they're like mini SD card yeah. things, then that seems more palatable. And much better. And like I said, there's so much stuff on the store um, that you, you you don't even need necessarily need to get Vita games because you've got so much of a back catalogue. People always talk about like, oh, I wish this was backwards compatible. I wish I could play this, this, and this. You, you can literally anyway. play it. You can literally play it on the Vita. Yeah. So go for it. Go get a Vita. Go, go get a Vita. Let's do it. Go get. I, I remember when the PSP. I seem to think the PSP came out around the same time as the Nokia Engage. I, I, I feel like around about that same time. And I love yeah. the Nokia Engage because mm. all the games were on SIM cards, yeah, so you were. had to take the battery out of the <laughs> Engage to put the game in, and then put the battery back in. It was perfectly it's fine. So good. And then people whinged about the Vita. Yep. <laughs> like you. Yep. That's what we had. <laughs> that's what we had. Uh, your third and final match, sir. My third and final match is the one that solidified me getting back into wrestling, Tom. And oh, it's a bit of it's a bit of Brit rest. Oh, from WWE though, yeah. it's a bit of Pete Dunne versus Tyler Bate for the UK Championship at Takeover Chicago. Amazing choice, so good. And this was the match. Uh, just on the off chance, I remember getting the... I got the network back because I wanted to watch a WrestleMania. Mm. And I was like, yeah, go on then. I'll just see what's on there. And weirdly enough, that was one of the recommended matches that popped up. And I was like, yeah, go on then. Didn't know who they were. No idea that we were two British wrestlers. And that was when I was like, wrestling's like this now? Like mm. Wrestling is stiff strikes. Wrestling's like classic but flippy but brutal at the same time and that blew my mind that wrestling could be like that and those two guys being from england too i was like that's awesome i'm being so young because mm. tyler's what 20 at that time yeah he's, he's just won he's the still belt. no age and he's amazing yeah and that baffled me as well that someone that young from the UK could do that. Cause that's what me and Mark wanted to do when we were kids. <laughs> we were like, that could have been us back in the day, but we didn't have like the resources and stuff to be able to do that. And um, the attitude of Pete Dunne, I love just like his swag, how just hard hitting he was with the strikes, how inventive they were with their counters and everything. Like there's the part where um, Tyler Bate goes to do like a run in standing shooting star press and Pete Dunne just locks in the triangle lock. And I'm like, that is so cool. I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, and being invested, that might have been like the first time I was really invested in the more technical Brit wrestling style of stuff. Um, and that opened a whole other door for me to go back and watch loads of progress stuff and then find out about more indie people like Tommy End and Dave Mastiff and people like that. And, and the whole uh, British Strong style thing as well. Um, and the crowd in that match chanting UK, there's just two young people from Britain, um, from working class backgrounds. And there's a whole arena of people chanting, this is awesome. UK fight forever. And I kind of like, again, not often proud of Britain. That makes you proud of Britain, which is a weird thing to say. But I, I don't always feel comfortable saying that for, for just because of some things that's happened. Yeah, because there's so much to to not be proud about. With yeah. the way. And, and, you know, you only have to look on Twitter during a, a European championship yes. to, to see the bits of Britain that we shouldn't be proud yeah, of. Yeah, exactly. But those two, you're like, wow, they tore the house down. I think that was the best match of that whole entire pay-per-view as well. Like, everybody was so invested in it. Mm. Everybody was so invested in both Dunn and Tyler Bate. And they just pulled everything out. And you, some things you're like, did they just do that on the fly? Like Pete Dunne going to do an X-Plex, but then right at the last minute turning it into a powerbomb. Which like, just that sort of the the quick thinking made it feel even more real as well. Mm. I remember showing my uh, my mum Pete Dunne that match and she was like, 
Um, it reminded her of when grandma would sit and watch like the big guys tangle up and stuff. And then, but then she'd see like Pete Dunn pull at the fingers and she'd be like, no, no, don't want that. <laughs> yeah. no, not, not all about that. <laughs> um, and my dad being like, oh no, I don't like that Tyler Bate ba- guy. He's just like, he's so nice. And that mm. reminded me of back in the day when grandma was like, good guys, bad guys, the good guy, get the bad guy. And my mum's there like, oh, he's a, he's a bad guy that Pete Dunn and my, and my mum's, uh, and my dad's sorry, like, uh, Tyler but he's so much of a good guy like it 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 brought back a lot of memories and um yeah it's it my love for both of those wrestlers now for getting me back into wrestling proper is insane i love pete dunn so much it's 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 unreal and uh that match if you've not seen that match that is a match you really need to go back and and watch because it is Oh, it stands the test. Even though it's not that old, it still stands the test of time. It's amazing. It's nice that as we're talking about this, we're about maybe a week or so ahead before. Mm-hmm. They do it again. They've got yep. Volta and Dragunov representing NXT UK at SummerSlam's My TakeOver weekend mm-hmm. show, providing, you know, all's gone well. Like, uh, you know, late behind the curtain on day of recording. Yeah. We've just done a video that's saying SummerSlam might be in the bin. Yep. Uh, so uh, as it stands, it's still happening, but we'll see. But mm. it's just nice that we talk about that. With, the, with that coming, with that on the horizon, and that and 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 Dragunov and Walter's first match that they had together as well oh, in, in NXT phenomenal, UK. unbelievable. Uh, we talked, we've spoken about this before on mm. on news and stuff, but I think there's a lot of people sleeping on NXT UK, and I get that there's a lot of backlash because they're taking up all the UK indie people and stuff, and it's not really good for the for the indie scene in the UK. But they are putting on so many good matches that people aren't. Witnessing. There's a high quality of wrestling the on really, that show. The women's roster mm-hmm. is the best roster in WWE at yeah. the moment, hands down. Even the men's, like the people that they've got there, unbelievable. And they pull it out of the bag every single week. NXT UK is great because it's like a 50-minute, one-hour show, and it's just matches. Like There's mm. a little bit of story stuff in there which helps develop the, the storylines further. There's not too much of it, though. It's just solid wrestling, and I like that so much. I feel like we get too many segments on Raw and stuff these days, mm. and it's nice just to get straight to the meat and potatoes of it. And that's what AEW are selling Rampage mm-hmm. as, like l- an hour of solid wrestling, a yeah. little bit of storyline peppered mm-hmm. in, but mainly wrestling. Yeah. And uh, and I think that's that's exactly the way to go. I think mm-hmm. there's a call for there's a call for wrestling shows that aren't bloated messes. Yeah. Call me old fashioned. <laughs> you know, I like a wrestling show that's like 45 minutes long. That's nice. And that's it. I can watch it while I'm making dinner. Because it's so hard. Even even though we're um, even though we we obviously cover all this on the channel and stuff, like it's hard to keep up with that um, that much wrestling because yeah. they're so long. And when a show isn't good. We still have to get through it because we still need to know what's going on. Mm. And it can be such a slog. But NXT UK never feels like a slog. And uh, please also go back and watch like the NXT UK title tournament from way back in the way back in the day where they were fighting like Pete Dunne and Tyler Bitt fighting for the belt and then Tyler Bitt wins it. That match is phenomenal as well. So much good stuff. Tommy End and 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 Pack on ne- obviously yeah, Neville at the time. They had themselves a little dust. They up, did didn't they, in Blackpool, which was awesome. And yeah, I just feel like a lot of people are, are, are sleeping on it. I've said it multiple multiple times, but there's so much stuff to go back on the network. Um, go back to the network on and, and and watch so many incredible matches that you might not have even thought were a thing, but they are. Um, where can people find Andrew online? Uh, you can find Andrew online at. Um, at Andrew underscore John with four ends at the end because I still haven't figured out this whole Twitter ha- Twitter <laughs> handle thing yet. It's catchy. On Twitter, yeah, it certainly is. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitch, twitch.tv forward slash cultaholic on a Monday at 6 p.m. where um, we just play games and chat most of all. And, uh, and and that's pretty much that's pretty much me, yeah. Two years ago we met, first time you walked into the office, you were sat at the other end of the office. Mm-hmm. And uh, every single time you you were the brightest person that walked into that office every single day. Thank you. Myself, myself not counted. Not yet. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it was the same for me going in and Bono. seeing you sat there. Always with a smile. Always happy to be there. A little bit of Yorkshire banter. And then you crack on with your day. And I love the fact that that was two years ago and we're sat here now and you have come along so such a long way. Thank you. And, and it's difficult when 
because uh, I, I get it. It's difficult when you when you have uh, what seems to be like imposter syndrome and anxiety mm. and and that feeling of self doubt. And 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 me just sitting here and saying, "You're great, you're great, you're great." It doesn't sink in. Like yeah. it goes about that low. So I, I'm not going to end this by by wishing you well. I'm going to end this by saying, "I hope one day you realize how good you are." Thank you. I hope one day you do. If you could, the final question would be. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned there how your last match sort of harkens back to you growing up watching, the, you know, the nan- your nana's watching the wrestling. Yeah. With you. And if Andrew now could go back and speak to Andrew then and offer just one piece of advice, mm. what would it be? Um, be proud of yourself because even though in the moment you'll think you're not doing good things, you're a small silly boy from a little town in Yorkshire that's gone on to do things you'd never imagine you could ever do and you should be proud of yourself and uh and just enjoy the moment we're proud of your small silly boy (laughs) thank you